Thank you. So first I'll start thanking the organizers, that, uh, Alejandro and Chris in particular, and all the KITP team for letting us again discuss with each other and not with our computer screen. And I apologize because with this title, I will not be able to talk about the tetra neutron. <laughs> So I have selected some three body systems that we have studied in within the Samurai collaboration. And I try to select them also following the, the main line of this workshop, which is uh, unitarity and scattering lens. So the first one will be Beryllium 16. Uh, this is the PhD work of Belen Monteagudo. So in this system, we have a core of beryllium-14 and two neutrons. It's uh, an unbound system. And the question that I will address here is, is this neutron-neutron scattering length strong enough to have a di-neutron emission that was claimed some years ago? And how can we see it? Then I will move on to another system. So boron-19, this time we have a bound system, but on top of this, scattering length, we have the boron 18 scattering length, but it's about 100 fermis. And the question here is, is this strong enough to find FMOP states in boron 19? And this work was published. So I asked this question to Emiko, Jaume, and Rimas, and the answer of the question is in this reference. And finally, I will replace the core of the system for our, with another neutron. And then the question seems more simple, but it's much more complex. So that the three neutron system have uh, states. This is the PhD from the PhD work of Cyril Lenau. And the questions here will be, do multineutrons exist? And the complementary question, should multineutrons exist? So I start with the first one, uh, the di-neutron emission in, in beryllium-16. So the concept of di-neutron emission was uh, connected to the, uh, to the study of two neutron halos. So we had a talk yesterday about two neutron halos. Here we have lithium 11 If you want to see, these are bound systems. So weakly bound, but they are bound. So if you want to see the neutrons, you have to take them out with a reaction. And so everything you see is a folding of the properties of the system and of the reaction that you use. Then if you move to resonances, it's easier because they will emit the neutrons spontaneously. And people were looking for particular resonances in which you had, uh, so the one neutron threshold was higher than the two neutron threshold. And so they, claim that in that case, the system would emit the di-neutron as a single uh, piece. And this is what was claimed in 2012 from, was published in PRL, beryllium-16 and the emission of a di-neutron. So we wrote a comment uh, saying that this interpretation was a bit simplistic or misleading, but you know how it works. So comments don't avoid the news to spread. And so all over the place, you found that the nucleus emitted a neutron pair as a single unit, uh, and ambiguously observed the neutron decay, and the neutron decay became one of the new atomic decay modes. So we try to repeat this experiment in better conditions and try to interpret in a more microscopic way. And before we go, I go to our take on version 16, I, I will take the opportunity to show you how we do this experiment. Because when I say that we want to study version 16, we have to make version 16. And in order to make version 16 and others, these such systems, we use secondary beams and secondary means that there is a primary. So to start with, we need a primary beam. This is an example of how are we going to build our beryllium-16 uh, uh, piece of art. So we start with something that is stable, but already neutron-rich. This is the uh, layout of, of Riken facility. 
here you have the superconducting ring cyclotron. And this is going to accelerate something stable, in our case, calcium-48, at almost 60% of the speed of light. And we are going to break it. So here, you break it, and you expect to have a very exotic piece out of this collision. In this particular case, you wanted to make boron-17. So in order to make boron-17, you have to remove all these protons and all these neutrons. So the probability is very low. But then, you, if you send enough calcium-48, you will have enough boron-17 out of this process. Boron-17 is very exotic already. It's a two-neutron halo. You have to guide it here to this spectrometer. You have to remove all the other pieces that don't look so, uh, so good. And now we need barium-16. So we are only one proton uh, away from it. So in the experimental room, we will remove the last proton, and then we have created our beryllium-16. So we start the experiment here in the room, but a lot of people had to work before uh, upwards to, to deliver this beam to us. And once we have beryllium-16 in the room, we have created it. So how, how can we see it? How can we take pictures? So you, we saw just, uh, earlier in the week, how can we see the atomic wave function? Uh, here we cannot see it really, so we have to find a way to see it. And in, our, in this case, beryllium-16 is unbound. So what we are going to see in our detectors is two neutrons and beryllium-14. So we need to make them somewhere in the room. And then in order to make them, as I told you, the closest thing we can do is a beam of boron-17. We are only one proton away. And the easiest way to remove this proton is with another proton. So we build a liquid hydrogen target, the boron-17 that comes from calcium-48 primary beam. And then we have to detect all those guys. We remove the proton. We have two protons in the target area. And this is everything we need. So we need proton detectors around the target. We need a dipole magnet that will bend Meridium 14, and we will detect it here. And then these are the neutron walls that will see the neutrons. And one, once we have all these things, we can take pictures of Meridium 16. So the static properties, what is the mass, the, the energy of the resonances, the width. And by measuring all the momenta, we can reconstruct the correlation so we can see how the decay went. So how was this energy shared between these three particles? And we can reconstruct the, the movie of the, of the reaction. This was the publication in 2012. So the picture of beryllium-16 was this one, one resonance. So these are the predictions of the shear model, a zero plus state and a two plus resonance, uh, excited state. They found some, some, something in between, relatively broad. And their movie was the neutron-neutron energy that they found it was very peaked at low values. And so they compare this with free body phase space and with a di-neutron decay, and they claim that the result was consistent with di-neutron decay. So this is what we measured. So I have a scale here to have the same correspondence from the first five MeV. This is from Belen, Belen's PhD. And you see, well, it does not look exactly the same. We have very clear here that should be the, the zero plus and then we see the two plus and then we our acceptance goes up to 10 MeV as we see that there is nothing else so the system has been formed and it has been formed in the ground and first excited state and when we feed this then we get the energies so we get the mass of, of beryllium 16 the second excited state and then by looking at the movie we realize so this state goes directly to beryllium-14. This one could go through beryllium-15 resonance, but it doesn't. It goes directly to beryllium-14. And now we wanted to interpret this in a way a bit more sophisticated than just uh, a two-neutron, two-body decay. We did this in collaboration with Jesus Casal. So he had calculated with the hyperspherical harmonics 
the three body problem in beryllium 16 and he has found these two states the zero plus and the two plus these are the Jacobi coordinates so neutron neutron distance and distance to the center of mass between the neutrons and the core so this you can associate this to some kind of like neutron configuration and you can associate this to a configuration in which the neutrons are on both sides of the core and then you see you can associate this to the low energy neutron signal for the ground state but we have seen both and in the two plus state there is no such configuration so we wanted to have a look more in detail of, uh, of this and for this we have a look this is the Dalit plot of the decay so here we have the neutron neutron energy and the beryllium 14 neutron energy so this is a reference that we have the two plus in beryllium 14 shows no correlations so the Dalit plot is flat and this is what we observe for the ground state of beryllium 16 and for the two plus state of beryllium 16. So both have a strong neutron neutron signal, a low neutron neutron energy, but the two plus signal is stronger than the ground state. And as I said, these are the projections. So we project into the neutron neutron. So this is the excess at low neutron neutron energy. The wave function of the ground state has a the neutron component but the two plus wave function doesn't so it's not so simple you cannot say that when you see a signal it's connected with a neutron component in the wave function and what Jesus did in collaboration with Belen was try to make our life easier so he has a wave function he tried to calculate the time dependent wave function and do the asymptotic part and try to predict what the energy is that we measure should be from the wave function. And this is what he obtained. So the, the technique is similar to what was done by Wang and Nazarevich in this paper. And you see, this is not a fit. This is, he took the wave function that he had calculated previously to our experiment and he, he projected the result. And in his framework, he understands that we may have a very strong signal even if we don't have a dineutron component. So for us, this was a big step forward because now we don't take pictures of the wave function, but we this is the closest that we can get. So we, we are measuring things that are connected with the wave function. Then uh, I was a bit too optimistic thinking that I could be, would be able to speak about these three systems. So I will go now to the three neutron system. And if we don't have time, then you can go to this reference and check the, the second subject. So multi-neutrons. The first question is, should they exist? Uh, I wrote with a, a review paper with Jaume about all the experiments and theories during this almost 60 years uh, on multi-neutrons. This is just a very short summary to say that for the three neutron system already from the 70s, uh, they realized that the, they had to modify a lot the the inter, the neutron neutron interaction so not few percent several hundreds percent and when they bound the system and they release the system this is the, the the region in which we should see observable resonances the the final point is very very far away from the physical region so they say they didn't say they should not exist they said they will not exist and not now and not ever <laughs> This is from, from this paper, from the last one. Then uh, Rimas, Jaume, and, and Emiko had a, they took a, a look to the four neutron case and also trying to uh, explore the T3 half neutron, three neutron force, three nucleon force, and they arrived to the same conclusion. So all these extra calculations concluded that the resonance should not exist. Then there were some many body approximations that found that maybe you could see resonances at low energies. I will not go into the details because I, I want to show you the, the new results. But well, very recently there were some work from Del Tuba, Rimas, uh, and also Chris and, and Alejandro saying that, well, maybe there are some issues here in the approximations that they use. 
and in this paper saying that even if resonances do not exist, we may see signals in the in the experiments that may, could come from the reaction that we use. So uh, this is a bit the summary of the of the situation. Before going to our results, I will show this is a very beautiful experiment that was done in the 1980 for the three neutrons. And so they were looking for three neutrons. This reaction is pi minus on tritium and final state is a photon and three neutrons. And they want to see the three neutrons. Again, as I told you earlier in the week, uh, most of these experiments don't use neutron detectors. That's a bit paradoxical, but so they use other detectors to detect the neutrons. So they, they want to see the three neutrons through the photon. And just, yeah, just to be clear, this picture has nothing to do with the experiment. <laughs> but I, I googled three balls and light, and this was one of the first uh, pictures that I, I found. So the experiment is, does, it looks a bit more complex than that. So this was the experiment. So you only need to measure a photon, but you, the photon has almost the energy of the pion mass. So you have to measure a very high energy photon, more than 100 MeV. So here you have the pion beam, here you have the liquid tritium target, and then you measure, you have a photon of 120 MeV, and you measure by the conversion into E plus uh, E minus. And this is the spectrum that they got. So very high statistics, very clean uh, measurement. This is the three neutron threshold. And if you have bound states, you should see peaks here to the right. If you have resonances, you should see peaks here to the left. And what they see, this line here corresponds to the continuum of the three neutrons with some neutron-neutron interaction. And these are the conclusions. So the experiment is highly sensitive to possible structures, but they see none. So this was in the 1980. Almost at the same time, in this paper from Offerman and Glockle, they said that people shouldn't waste their money in doing experiments to look for the three neutrons. Because they said that the changes needed in the, in the interaction are so huge that there is no, it makes no sense to do very expensive experiments uh, to measure, to search for three neutron resonances. So we had an experiment, a beautiful experiment saying that there is no evidence of three neutron resonances, a theoretical paper saying that we should not waste our money. So we didn't waste money looking for the three neutron. We wasted money looking for the tetra neutron. <laughs> and then the three neutron system came for free. So this is the campaign, uh, the last campaign at Ricken of the different experiments looking for the tetra neutron. In this last one, we were the only ones to look for, to detect the neutrons, the four neutrons here with Neuland and Nebula detectors. This was the channel. So we, we want to remove, use a proton target. We remove one proton from helium-8, we form hydrogen-7, and we look for the decay into a triton and four neutrons. In the same reaction, the proton can remove a neutron from helium-8, and then you can populate an excited state in helium-7. And then you can look for the decay into helium-4 and three neutrons. So this was the, the byproduct that we wanted to explore for the three neutron system. This is an experiment from 1999 in which they have observed such a state, a state that decays into three neutrons. So in this case, they remove the neutron with this PD reaction. So the proton target will remove one neutron from helium-8 and mega deuteron, and they detect the deuteron, and by missing mass, they deduce the, 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 the energy of helium-7. Here is what they see when they tag the deuteron with a helium-6, they see the ground state the miss, by missing mass, the ground state of helium-7, that is here, is well known, that decays by one neutron emission. Then they tag with helium-4, and of course the ground state disappears because the helium-4 threshold is higher than the ground state. But they see a new peak here that corresponds to a sighted state roughly at 3 MeV. And this state, you see that it only appears when you ask for helium-4. It does not appear when you ask for helium-6. 
So this state decays always to helium-4 plus 10 neutrons, even if it could decay to helium-6 plus 1 neutron. So this is why in the, the title of the paper, they say excited state is unusual structure. What they don't know, because they are doing this by missing mass, is which way the, decays, the decay goes. So do we have direct emission of the three neutrons, or do we have one neutron emission to the helium-6-2+, plus, and then the helium-6-2 plus decays to helium-4? So they, this they didn't know, and this is what we want to, to know. And so I saw you a sketch of the how do we do experiments. This is how the experiments look like. Here we have the target area. <laughs> this is the dipole. Here we detect the fragments, and here we are the neutron walls. And this is the target area where you have the, the, the liquid hydrogen target and the proton detectors. And this is how the people that do the experiments look like. So we have Chinese, uh, Europe, uh, French, German, and Japanese mainly. And uh, then I will show preliminary results from PSD of Cyril. So this is the experiment that we were trying to do, oxygen-18 primary beam in this case, helium-8 secondary beam, we remove one proton and we look for the decay into the triton. But of course, if we have helium-7, we can decay to helium-6 or to helium-4. This is what we are looking for in this particular case. So in this reaction, you tag for helium-6 and you measure one neutron and you see clearly the ground state of helium-7. And the statistics are huge. So we have tens of millions of events. Now we ask for two neutrons in coincidence with helium-4, and you see very clearly the two plus resonance of helium-6 that decays into an alpha particle and two neutrons. So we are populating also this resonance in, in our reaction. And now we look for three neutrons. What ha do we have something here? Again, this is the helium-7 ground state in the energy scale of helium-7, and this is the spectrum corresponding to three neutrons. So we have detected one alpha particle and three neutrons, and the total energy. Now this is no longer missing mass. This is the first time that, the, that we measure the mass of this resonance, and we see clearly a resonance slightly below 3 MeV that corresponds to this uh, very particular excited state. Now we have to know, do we go directly here? So do we emit three neutrons? Do we have a chance to form a tri-neutron or not? Or do we go through the helium-6-2 plus that we see here? So missing mass experiments stop. At this point, we can go on because we have detected the neutrons. So what we do here, you have, we remove one of the neutrons from the event and we reconstruct the partial energy. So the alpha particle with only two of them. And you see here clearly the two plus. So this means that in this decay, we are going through the two plus of helium six, but then we can compare with both decay paths. And this is the best fit of the data. So we are clearly dominated by the sequential path one neutron, then two, but we have a significant component of 20% in which the three neutrons are emitted directly. So now we have found the state, we have isolated the direct part. Now, finally, we can check, do we have a three neutron resonance or not? These are two predictions. So here we are going to exploit the cinematics of the decay. This parameter, this is the angle the, between the alpha particle and the neutrons, the minimum angle between the alpha particle and the neutron. So we have three possibilities, we take the, the smallest one. If you have a tri-neutron resonance, then all these angles should be big. The alpha particle is back to back with the neutrons, and this is what we expect, for example, for a one, new, one MeV resonance in the three neutron system, the, the orange uh, line. If you have four body phase space, then you have all possible angles and then you get the red curve. And when we compare the data to, to these two curves, then it's much closer, it's much closer 
to the to the phase space case. This analysis, so I, I didn't write, I didn't write preliminary all over the place. I wrote it here. This is very preliminary. You see uh, a small excess of counts, close to minus one, and so you can you can play the game. Uh, what happens if I combine both scenarios? If you add ten percent of the tri-neutron curve to the red one, you get this blue curve. That works very well, but this is really what we are exploring right now. So the, the, what, what we do know is that we have for the first time detected a direct free neutron emission. There is no significant signal, but now we have to look closer to these discrepancies. And of course, we have to explore the phase space because we know that the phase space is dominated by this sequential decay. But the good news is that we have everything we need to do it. So now it's just time that we need. And so for the last point, I don't have uh, time to develop. So I will just say very quickly uh, that where we started this, this question. So these are excited states in boron 19. So you have a, we have measured boron 17 and two neutrons. The scattering lengths of the system are my, minus 20 and minus 100 fermis. And these are the states that we see. So we see here a first excited state and then a series of states. And we can have a look to the, the uh, decay of these states. And the first one, clearly in the decay, you see here in the fragment, in the boron 17 neutron energy, you see clear the boron 17 virtual state. And in the neutron-neutron axis, you see the neutron-neutron uh, virtual state. So you see both. And the idea was, so the, the, the scattering length of boron 18, we have only an upper limit, minus 50 fermis. And the question was, can we have a, a FIM of trime? So I will not go into the details here. The short answer is that we don't have an FIM of trime. But we are very close to the unitary limit. So this is from the calculation of Emiko, Jaume, and Rimas. If this is the binding energy of boron 19, and this is the scattering length of boron 18, when you put this scattering length to infinity and you put the neutron neutron scattering length to infinity, you get this line here. That is very in very good agreement with the experimental value, but of course the, the experimental value has a very big error bar that goes through all the slide. So what we would like experimentally to do is try to constrain the, the binding energy of boron 19 and try to constrain the scattering length of, of boron 18. And for the last point, we measure the virtual state of boron 18 from a carbon 19 beam, but we measure also from a boron 19 beam, from a carbon 20 beam. So for many different beams, you see the virtual state in most of them. And with all this, we expect to determine better the scattering length of boron 18 and see how it affects the free body system of, of boron 19. And so just to be in time, my conclusions. So the question in beryllium 16 was about the dineutron emission. So the answer is that there is no dineutron emission. We have a complex free body decay and we have been able to probe the two neutron wave function with the help of our colleagues. For the FIM of trimers here in boron 19, there are no trimers, but the system is very well described at the unitary limit. So this is a very particular case, we think, in, in these systems. For the three neutron system, we have detected for the first time the three neutrons in a three neutron decay. We don't have a signal of the tri-neutron yet, but at least we didn't waste money mm -hmm. looking for it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions uh, to Miguel? Uh, before the people are thinking, uh, one of the pieces of the nuclear interaction which is less known is the neutron-neutron interaction. 
Uh, of course, uh, we are looking to, to this three neutron resonance or four neutron or whatever, but I saw a lot of data. For example, you say in the first part, probe of the two neutron wave function. The two neutron wave function has been constructed with a two neutron interaction. Uh, that um, what is your uh, expectation that all this data can be to some extent also use it to determine the neutron-neutron interaction through uh, constructing wave function or constructing or trying to describe the data and so on. We, we are not precise enough. So scattering length of the neutrons is minus 18.5 plus minus 0.4 or 0.5 fermis. We are not precise enough to decrease this, this uh, error bar. So in these experiments, you see the effects of the neutron-neutron scattering length, but you are not able, you are not sensitive to a half Fermi. So there are experiments planned at Riken. So Tom Aumann's group will do a very high precision experiment of the helium six, helium six uh, going to alpha plus two neutron, and they want to measure the neutron-neutron energy, relative energy, with very high precision and see if they can be sensitive to the to to, uh, to 0.1 fermis but that's all so it will be still bigger than the proton proton scattering length or the neutron proton scattering length so we are limited because we cannot make a neutron target so we can make a neutron beam but we cannot make a neutron target so you yes yes i know John? Yeah, so I was wondering, you, you have the emission of all these neutrons, and probably you explained, but perhaps I didn't get it. Uh, so are they emitted simultaneously, or, you know, what's the, the timing actually between the emissions? Yeah, so in, in this case, well, here I said, I made this plot saying that they were emitted simultaneously and not through this resonance. So we see this kind of things in these plots. So here you have the... the for the core neutron energy, when you go through a resonance in the core plus one neutron, then you see some signals along this perpendicular to this axis. So these plots here are telling us that in both cases, we are emitting the neutrons at, at once. But, but how precisely is it really? How, how, how precisely can you measure it? We, we, we have a lot of cases. I, I don't have any here. We have a lot of cases in, way, in which you see very clearly here. Well, I have, I have one, so this plot, for example, is the equivalent of the former plot in which you saw something flat. Here you see very clearly that you are going through the virtual state of the boron 18. So this, if you have no interaction between the three particles, it should be flat. And you see clearly that you are going through the virtual state of boron 18. So in other systems in which, in this is a virtual state, so you have a concentration of counts close to zero. When you go through a resonance at a given energy, what you see is a reach here. In some of these plots, you see the reach, and then you are 100% sure that you went through this resonance. You know the width of the resonance, so you know the, the lifetime. So you can have the, you can reconstruct the chronology of the, of the decay. Okay. In the bottom problem, this uh, the second point, it is of course fundamental to have a, a, a good measurement of the scattering length, but let me remind you that there are two of them. And in our calculation, we make some answers about the other one, assuming that it was of normal size, but this is a very poor thing. So would it be possible because in the Paul talk yesterday, they said that they have polarized experiments now at MSU. So sh should it be possible to obtain both the scattering length? And then we have a very nice description of these systems. You could do it, but with systems that are much closer to stability. In the bottom, no. Yes. Then they... So when I there is this min minus fifty, yeah, or but minus one hundred is one of of the two, and the yeah, other but 
so here, all these things are proportional. So if you want twice the number of events, you need to accelerate twice the number of cars in 48. And you have a probability here. This guy here is the probability, the cross section to go more and more exotic. So the cross sections are going down. You have less and less uh, intens intensities, smaller. And so the cross section that you use here, you are very limited. When the intensities are very low, you can only use high cross sections if you want to be able to detect something. So when you go closer to stability, then the, the possibility of reactions uh, increases because you can try cross sections that are very low. But in our cases, we are limited to cross sections that are relatively high. And we cannot do these polarized experiments for, with boron 19. We can do them with less exotic borons, but not with boron 19. And of course, the problem compared to, to atomic physics is that we cannot change the scattering lengths. So it turns out that the interesting one is here. So if you want to look for this effect, you have to go there. You cannot. This is the best one, but we have three scattering mm -hmm. and now only one and a half. <laughs> More questions? Probably very stupid one. I mean, the last example of the three neutron decay you could met model so well by just taking the phase space density. Why is this? Why is there no mechanism populating particular angles? Uh, here. Yeah. So, well, I, I, I try to simplify. So this red line is not pure phase space. So this is phase space with uh, a pairwise interaction between the neutrons. So, but yeah. So compared to what uh, we, I, I wanted to illustrate two extremes, but in this, this one is not pure phase space. So that's why also why I wanted to make it simple as a message, but everything is hidden here. So the phase space is, we are exploring the, the effect of the helium six two plus. Uh, path and also of the neutron neutron scattering length uh, role in the decay. Other questions to Miguel? Yeah, it seems to okay. be. Okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I like these experiments very much. I'm trying to understand. Uh, the argument you made the, the other day that kinematics of the experiment can distinguish, uh, say, a tri-neutron or a tetra, when two, two say, nuclei collide and produce a, a new nucleus and four neutrons or three neutrons, why, the, what is the argument that the kinematics can distinguish whether it is a resonance of the entire final state versus a resonance just of one part of the final state, which is the tri or tetraneutron. I, I still haven't quite been able to understand this argument. Yeah, so this is, this is a point I, I, I didn't have the time to make, but uh, in all the four neutron signals that have been obtained, you always have a reaction. And then the question is, where does this signal come from? Is the system, as, as I said at the beginning with lithium-11, you want to measure the two neutrons from the halo of lithium-11, you need to take them out. And once you have taken, taken them out, what do you see? What is the role of this taking them out in, in what you see? And this is what we have been dealing with with the four neutron system. So our proposal, uh, I roughly showed here the different proposals of the Tetra Neutron campaign in the 2016 and 17 at Riken. So our proposal was different from the others in the fact that we wanted, we used a cross section that is much higher and that's why we could afford the detection of the neutrons. 
but we wanted to measure the four neutrons in a decay. So in the decay of hydrogen seven. And this is one step is, is qualitatively different. So we are not populating the four neutron system in, with a reaction. We are populating hydrogen seven with a reaction. And once you did, the decay is spontaneous because the system is unbound. So what one, one of the points of the selling points in the proposal, because there were all these experiments and people were saying Riken is not going to accept another tetraneutron experiment because they have enough already. But our selling point was, it, this is different. We are not making, creating the tetraneutron. The tetraneutron is going to be emitted by some, by some state. And in the helium seven case, we realized that we had the same thing. So in this, if these resonances are emitted from an unbound state, uh, then you don't have to unfold the, the reaction mechanism from what you see. And then the kinematics can tell you things in this way. So for, this is, when you say that a resonance of the whole system, this is the resonance of helium-7. So this is the energy of the alpha particle and the three neutrons. So we have created this. And this line shape is the resonance that we created. This is what you were referring to when you said the resonance of the whole system. But and when you are doing missing mass, this is all you can get. When you are doing invariant mass, you can go further. So you know the, the energy of the whole system, you have the, the momenta, then you can look at the correlations. And the correlations will tell you Uh, the, for, for example, the difference between this scenario and this scenario, because you 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 are you know if they were back to back or they not, were not back to back. Of course, yeah. So now we have something that is almost the phase state, but not completely. Then we have to be careful how we describe this. But this is a difference from from. From the from the other experiments, we it is a decay, and we have all the pieces of the decay, so you can you can measure the correlation. But but I mean certainly, if if it is a resonance of the full final state, it can decay many many different ways. Yeah. There's a very large space of decay. Yeah, this is what you have here. So the red line is all the ways in which this helium seven resonance could decay if you had no resonances in the decay. Right, and, and I guess what I don't see proven is that going to a resonance of the whole system and then fragmenting into f the four neutrons, Here, for this example, pathway is excluded. We were not expecting to see this, but our point was that if this existed, we would be able to see it because then four body phase space becomes two body phase space and they are very different. But even that does not, I mean, it does not prove the neutrons were bound without the other par particle present. Well, it proves that the neutrons uh, among all the free space available, they went into the part of the phase space right, in which right. they have a very close energy. Well, yeah, it can mean that they had this attraction that emphasized this you know, pulling on each other to come out together, but it doesn't mean that the three body system was bound or resonant. Mm, then it becomes a question of semantics. So if you find neutrons that are very close in energy, then like atoms or any other thing, when, when, when few bodies go very close in energy all the time, then something is happening and then you have to find the way, the way to name it. Uh, maybe a related question. So these two curves that you show, the red and the orange one, are these drawn qualitatively or um, by hand or these are uh, result of some uh, calculation? No, no, it, it looks uh, made by hand by a child, but <laughs> this is the other statistics are not, in, are not high enough. So these are Monte Carlo simulations of few tens of millions of events because we have all the efficiencies. And, yeah, but the, and, and, and for example, got, the yellow, the, the orange curve, yeah. Is it assuming certain uh, energy of the resonance and yeah, width? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was for a one MeV tri-neutron resonance. 
And what is the width? One in it is. So it was just a toy example to show what would happen if we had a resonance. Of course, if the data has been some, somewhere here, then we could tune these parameters and make a fit to see with which resonance are they compatible with. But what we wanted to show here is that they are very far from this orange uh, line shape. Thank you. Uh, so now is our time. So thank you, Miguel. Thank you.